Good morning, everyone. This is Father Kirillo Sibrahim. Uh, we're just going to wait another minute or so for other people to join. So if you don't mind, just uh, allowing for a little bit of quiet uh, for a minute, just for others to join, and then we'll get started. Okay, let's start. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you this morning. Uh, and I wanna thank uh, Father uh, Anthony and Father Gabriel and all the other servants, the wonderful servants at Coptic Orthodox Answers for uh, asking me to uh, spend some time in reflection with you this morning uh, during these very difficult and troubled times that all of us are going through. And uh, the title of the reflection for us this morning uh, that I was asked to speak about is Let Not Your Heart Be Troubled. And of course, many of us are familiar with this verse from the Holy Scriptures and the Gospel of St. John. The context of the verse takes place on the night of the Last Supper on Holy Thursday, when our Lord Jesus Christ is assembled with his holy disciples and anticipating already a night of confusion and mystery and the upcoming events that will be unfolding with regards to the passion of our Lord, our Lord anticipates, of course, that this will be a very difficult time for his disciples. And so he says to them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. And like the disciples on that night, we go through periods of our lives that are times of mystery, times of confusion, times of anxiety. And so we can put ourselves with them on that holy night and reflect on what it means for us to acquire inner peace uh, and deal with the circumstances that are surrounding us in this difficult time that we're all facing as, as, a, as, a, as not just as a, as a country, but internationally as the whole world. Um, the first thing I want to um, say is that our Lord himself understood what it meant to have a troubled heart. He himself experienced a troubled heart. In the same gospel that we just referenced when he spoke about his betrayal, and the chapter even before that, in chapter 12, verse 27, in the words of Christ himself, he said, now my soul is troubled. So clearly in Gethsemane, our, our Lord experienced a troubled heart. So he understands in his humanity and his experience in the incarnation, how the world and the circumstances of the world and the difficulties that we face create that troubled heart within us. And whether it's this pandemic and global instability, whether it's our finances, whether it's when we face elements of terrorism and persecution, whether it's worrying about our children and their safety, we know we know the, the number of things that can trouble us. And we know what it feels like when our heart is troubled. We feel isolated, we feel paralyzed or overwhelmed. We feel powerless, out of control, disconnected, afraid, angry despair, grief, all of these human experiences and emotions uh, are very um, much experiences that all of us have experienced at different times in our lives. So when Christ says, let not your heart be troubled, he's not asking us to ignore the many things surrounding us that are troubling, but he's asking us to go within ourselves and to 
address the trouble that's within. He's asking us to go and find what is it that our lives are built upon, what is at the center of our lives that we can anchor our heart to and find peace and find calmness and tranquility during troubling times. When we think about the life of our Lord himself, it was the relationship of the Son with the Father. So that even in Christ's own experience, the troubling circumstances of his betrayal, of his passion, but he always went back to the relationship of the Father and doing the Father's will. And so in the same way, he's asking the disciples and he's asking all of us, what is at the center of your heart? What is at the center of your life? What is your life built upon? If God is at the center and, and God is the foundation upon which everything in your life is built upon, go back and find that center, tether your life to that center. And you find then the inner strength, calmness and peace in order to weather the storm that we're facing. So every time we go through a difficulty, uh, a trial, a painful situation in our life, we find that these circumstances in our life both expose our faith and also act to purify our faith, to, to raise us to a greater level of faith. Father Thaddeus Dodger in his book, The Gift of Faith says, a shallow faith dependent solely on education, feelings, and certain habits collapses in the face of difficulties. In trials of faith, God wants a person who believes to become stripped of what is not faith, but is only a supportive faith. So what many of us might be experiencing during, during this time is that we come to realize the painful reality of a shallowness of faith and that many of the things that we thought were faith were simply supports to our level of faith. Again, he says, when God wants you to reach the depths of faith, he can give you very difficult trials. He can take much away from you and even strip you of many supports. God may want you to become uprooted so that not having any human securities, you can look for redemptive help to come from him alone. So when all of the things, the supports, the securities, all of the things that are uh, stripped from us and we, we realize we don't have control over them, then we turn our eyes to God. We look to him and we seek redemptive help from him, knowing that he alone can save us. So many of us, when we think about faith, uh, we talk about faith simply a, at a level of belief that God exists. And unfortunately, many of us have seen in the West, especially, uh, almost uh, an entertainment value um, ascribed to the question of uh, faith, whether God exists or doesn't exist. So that now you have on many college campuses, you have these debates that are held between uh, an apologist for, let's say, the Christian um, religious faith tra tradition and uh, an atheist. And you have an audience and you have, you know, uh, timed uh, debates and rebuttals and and supposedly there should be a winner at the end and somehow if somebody wins then then either God has proven to exist or God has proven not to exist and and if we find that we can prove to somebody the existence of God we consider it a victory but that's not really faith that is the beginning of faith for sure St. Paul, Hebrews eleven six 6 says, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. But the faith that is asked of us as Christians and those who believe in God is a faith that leads us to an ultimate life of trust and surrender and abandonment to God, to simply believe that God exists and to simply believe that he's powerful and all-knowing and uh, all-present is not enough. Father Matthew the Poor says that faith is the highest gift offered to mankind. And it represents, he says, the columns on which the temple of the spiritual life stands. So we move then from belief to trust, to surrender, to abandonment. Not only that God is but that God is goodness itself. 
but he is total goodness, total beauty, total love. Um, if you were paying attention to the news in the last couple of days, and uh, you read about the, um, the blessing that Pope Francis gave to the world from, from Rome, from St. Peter's Square, uh, he was reflecting on the gospel uh, account of the disciples in the boat, in the storm, and our Lord Jesus Christ asleep in the stern of the boat. And when the storm came and they were frightened, they awakened the Lord and said, do you not care that we are perishing? And he rebuked them for their lack of faith. Now, on the one hand, they believed that Christ could do something. Otherwise, they wouldn't have awakened him. So they had a certain level of faith. They believed in his power. They believed in his strength and his authority. But the question that Pope Francis was uh, kind of reflecting on was when they said, do you not care? Do you not care that we are perishing? So though, though they believed in him, and even to an extent believed in his power, but they doubted his goodness. They doubted his care. They doubted that the providence of his divine will was a good providence, that ultimately it was a providence that cared for every aspect of their lives. <clears throat> and so this is the, the kind of faith that we want to talk about. It's the faith that leads us to trusting not just that God is, and that he is capable, but that he is ultimately perfectly good in his will and in his providence. And therefore, we can risk trusting our lives to him completely, surrendering our lives to him completely. So again, going back to the example of our Lord himself, what was that anchor that he always referred to in his own earthly sojourn it was the will of the father and oftentimes when he was asked about his work or his his food he said my food is to do the will of my father and he often spoke about how he had no other purpose no other agenda no other will of his own than to do the father's will so the the will of the father was the center, the anchor in the life of Christ. And therefore, he shows us, again, how we face that troubled heart within us. What is the anchor that is, again, our heart supposed to be um, attached to? So, so trust in God can never simply be an intellectual or a psychological uh, belief or a state, but it's a life of growing surrender, entrustment to the will of God. When we perceive that God's will is the source of our good and the source of our happiness and that every hair of our head is counted and known by God, right? then we can deal, we can confront the troubled heart within us. We can begin to experience a deeper inner peace even in the midst of the storm that's surrounding us. So we might ask then, well, what is the will of God? And I don't want to spend too much time on this point because we really need a lot more time to kind of unpack this concept in and of itself. But think of the will of God in, in two levels. There is the, the stated will of God, the signified will of God, which is, the things that we know God asks of us for our own happiness, right? They are the things that are communicated to us in the commandments, the Beatitudes, and all of the gospel um, counsels and teaching that we have in, um, given our lives over to uh, in our employment, if we have a religious vocation. So we know that there are certain things that go along with um, our vocation, there are th certain things that God has clearly stated is his will for all of us. And then there's what we might call the permissible will of God or the providential will of God, which is how God's will is manifested to us throughout the circumstances of our lives. 
They are the things that we confront on a moment by moment basis, the good things as well as the evil things that he permits to happen. Now, of course, as you have heard stated many, many times by all the blessed fathers and uh, servants in these last several days, God is not the author of evil and God does not will evil, but he does allow it. And he only allows it because he can bring about something good from it, because he can even, as uh, St. Augustine says, bring about something even better from it than had the evil never occurred in the first place. And so the permissible or the providential will of God, which encompasses all of the good and the evil things that we encounter on a day-by-day -day basis, um, are, 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 is the area that may be a little bit more difficult for us to, to deal with when we encounter something like what our world is going through right, right now with this pandemic. So, but we have to, um, we have to embrace, again, in trust, in surrender and abandonment to the goodness of God and to the love of God behind all of what he permits. And um, we could say then that there are uh, levels of submission to the will of God. There are maybe, there may be, we might consider a beginning step would be um, that we uh, accept the will of God with patience, but conform ourselves to the will of God with great difficulty. When when the will of God clashes with our uh, with the, with our own likings, with our own views, with our own expectations, and in this level, we might see suffering as something that at at any cost has to be something that we escape from. Then we might think of of a more advanced level of submission to the will of God, in which we see the will of God clearly as the guide of our life, and we accept it with, with great reverence and devotion. Um, and while we don't seek the cross, we try to carry the cross with, with joy, with um, serenity. Um, and then there's maybe a more perfect level that we see in many of the lives of the saints, which is where the will of God, like in the life of Christ, becomes our food. Right? But we have no desire, no joy, no happiness outside of the will of God. And the cross becomes something that we run towards. Uh, not that we seek suffering, but that, but that the love that we want to show in accepting our suffering, the love that we want to manifest in carrying our cross becomes the most joyful thing um, that characterizes our existence. So there's a beautiful uh, vision that a nun had and she wrote in her diary. And uh, I'll, I'll read you in her own words um, this vision, which kind of, I think, uh, exemplifies um, these three levels that I'm speaking about. She said in her diary, then I saw the Lord Jesus nailed to the cross. When he had hung on it for a while, I saw a multitude of souls crucified like him. Then I saw a second multitude of souls and a third. The second multitude was not nailed to their crosses, but were holding them firmly in their hands. The third were neither nailed to their crosses nor holding them firmly in their hands, but were dragging their crosses behind them and were discontent. Jesus then said to me, do you see these souls? Those who are like me in pain and contempt will be like me also in glory. And those who resemble me less in pain and contempt will also bear less resemblance to me in glory. So, again, a beautiful description of how when we, when we arrive at that highest level of accepting God's will, his providential will, his permissible will, and we embrace the love that we, through faith and trust and surrender, uh, we know is behind that permissible will, permissible will, then we see the glory that comes with carrying the cross. We see the glory that's awaiting us in the next life. So in order for us to, to, to begin to embrace God's providential will, we need to embrace mystery. And mystery is not something, especially for us Westerners, is not something that uh, we, we, we accept lightly. 
because we want to figure everything out. We want to have an answer for everything. We want to understand everything. We want to be able to control everything. And and mystery by very by its very definition is something that eludes us. It's something that escapes us and leaves us scratching our heads. So uh, there's a beautiful quote by Sister Ruth Burroughs in her book called Living in Mystery. Uh, and I want to read this quote to you. She says, "For none of us is the sorry. For none of us is the experience of mystery unreservedly comforting. Far from it. I found my answer." where it is there for all of us and the quote surpassing knowledge of Jesus Christ unquote quoting Philippians 3 8 and in that and that alone can we have the courage to live consistently in mystery refusing to give way to fear because in Jesus we have the assurance that mystery is indeed holy mystery all-encompassing all-sufficing beauty and love we must accept to live without certainties and cease craving for them we have one all-sufficing certainty, God is love. So again, when we, when we embrace mystery, when we embrace the mystery of God and the mystery of his will and the mystery of the events unfolding around us, because we believe and we trust and we surrender to the love that's behind it, then we understand that there's only one mystery, and that mystery is Christ. And he has been revealed to us, and he has revealed to us the love of God. The mystery of Christ is that he has revealed to us our Father in heaven who loves us and who cares for us more than the lilies of the field and more than the birds of the air, and that every hair of our head is numbered and known by him. And nothing happens without his will, and nothing happens without his love, which embraces all of the events that he allows to happen. So, so mystery implies darkness. And again, Father Dodger, he says, faith does not remove darkness. It does just the opposite. It requires it. Faith doesn't remove the darkness. Faith requires the darkness. But we have to, again, embrace the darkness, embrace the mystery. And this reminds me of a story that if you've heard me speak before, you probably have heard me mention this story about Mother Teresa about a priest uh, whose name is Father John, John Kavanaugh who visited her in Calcutta, India. He met Mother Teresa and she asked him, what can I do for you? And Father Kavanaugh, Kavanaugh said to her um, that she wanted her to pray for him. So she asked, uh, what do you want me to pray for? And uh, he voiced to her a request that he had come thousands of miles from the United States. And then he asked her, he's saying, Pray that I have clarity. She said firmly, no, I will not do that. When he asked her why, she said, clarity is the last thing you are clinging to and must let go of. When Father John commented that she always seemed to have clarity, the same clarity that he longed for, she laughed and said to him, I have never had clarity. What I have always had is trust. So I will pray that you trust God. Craving clarity sometimes is just another way of feeding, again, our own egos. It's a way of, again, assuring that we are in control. It's, again, assuring that uh, I don't have to surrender and take the risk of trusting God. Right? So sometimes when we, when we say we want clarity, although, although, of course, our Lord in his goodness and his kindness and mercy often times when we're seeking his will, will give us moments of clarity. But when we don't have those moments, when, uh, when we seek clarity, when we pray deeply about something and we don't find the answer and we remain in mystery, we remain in darkness, it's the time for us to let go of the desire for clarity and to just have trust, to just have um, a willingness to risk surrendering ourselves to God. There's a beautiful um, uh, encounter in the sixth chapter of St. John's Gospel about uh, the disciples when they um, hear the Lord speaking uh, in the, the famous discourse the, of the bread of life about his body and his blood becoming uh, flesh and you know food and drink. And the Gospel of St. John tells us that many people uh, left the Lord 
many of the who were following him ceased to follow him because they couldn't accept his words. And the Lord turned to Peter and the other disciples and said, do you also want to go away? And Peter, in one of the most moving and beautiful passages of the gospel, says, uh, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. And what a beautiful expression here of somebody who is in mystery, who is in darkness, who is confounded by teachings that he doesn't understand. understand. And his response is, Lord, to whom even you, then to entrust ourselves completely to you. So I'm going to read a beautiful quote meditating on this incident by uh, a sister, Sarah Marie uh, Kowal, in an article called Eucharistic Love. She says, Peter did not understand the profound mystery Jesus had just revealed. He had absolutely no idea how one was to eat the flesh and blood of Christ and be saved. He knew only one thing. Jesus had the words of eternal life. Here is one of the most beautiful acts of faith in the Gospels. Peter did not wait for proof, for evidence, for explanation. With only faith, he puts his trust in a God who can be trusted. Even though he does not see, he believes. He trusted in the source before he understood the mystery. Let me just repeat that part again because it's so beautiful. He trusted in the source before he understood the mystery. May we all, she continues, accept the grace to believe with Peter in the profound mystery always before us. May we humbly bow down with Peter and exclaim, Lord, I do not understand. I do not fully comprehend. But to whom shall I go? You have the words of eternal life. Oh, the glory and knowledge that will pour forth abundantly from this simple yet profound act of faith. So we have to then um, pay attention to the, the very minute details of our lives as they unfold on a day-by-day and moment-by-moment basis, not to get caught up in really just something at this point is just in our imagination, right? We, we spend so much time, especially as adults, thinking about the past and thinking about the future. And both, usually the past are, is filled with all kinds of regrets and the future is filled with all kinds of anxieties and fears. And to bring our, our hearts and our minds to the present moment where, where we have the possibility to experience the grace of God now, to experience his love and his mercy now, and to trust entrust our lives to him at this very moment. And this is something that I think is very important for us, you know, as we're glued to our TV screens um, and the news stations and our Facebook feeds and uh, all of the um, other aspects of social media, waiting for something that's going to alleviate all of our fears and anxieties about tomorrow, about next week, about next year. And what we really need to do is bring ourselves to the present moment, to remember that God at this moment is, is within me around me, outside of me, and uh, encompassing me with his love, with his divine providence, which is full of love and goodness. And to, to, to again, accept the darkness and the mystery that is around us at this time. So, um, again, many of you maybe have heard me speak before also of a, um, another uh, saint in the... Uh, and the Vietnamese tradition, Marcel Vaughn, uh, a young Vietnamese martyr who was granted many beautiful mystical experiences of, of um, seeing and talking with the Lord Jesus Christ. And he wrote many of these experiences down um, at the uh, obedience of his spiritual father. And in one of these encounters, Marcel asks the Lord Jesus, he says, what can I do to prove my love to you, Lord? The Lord says to him, first of all, this is in Christ's response to Marcel, he says, first of all, accept all the little inconveniences that I send you and buy inconveniences. But at the core of this message is something important for us, especially those of us in the Orthodox and Catholic traditions who are fasting now, which is what's more important, the external asceticism of fasting and prostrations and all these kinds of outward um, practices, or the inward acceptance of the providence of God as it unfolds in my life, whether it be the little inconveniences or the greater inconveniences, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a kind of interior asceticism 
which involves, again, entrusting myself moment by moment to God, entrusting myself to his love and his goodness at every moment of my life, fighting against the inclination to succumb to fear and anxiety, fighting against the inclination to control and be able to have an understanding and answer to everything. And that kind of inward asceticism is more important than the external forms of asceticism that sometimes are actually quite easy to do because they, they, can, they can rely a little bit more on, on, on simply on human willpower. But the interior asceticism is something that is more precious in the sight of God when inwardly we have made those sacrifices and those uh, submissions. Again, we can look at the example of the Holy Family um, and the vulnerability that God allowed the Holy Family to go through, even though they could have simply uh, demanded that they be exempt from the mystery and the darkness and the trials of life. But we see that, especially, for example, if we take one example like the flight of the Holy F Family to Egypt, right? Why, why would it be necessary for that kind of trouble for the mother of God and St. Joseph and the child? Why couldn't God simply blind the eyes of Herod and his soldiers to just pass by the, the, the child Jesus? Why couldn't he have hidden them somewhere in some um, village around Judea or Galilee? Why was it necessary for the mother of God to suffer and St. Joseph to suffer in that way? Right? But again, it, it shows us that even the, the greatest, I mean, even the Lord and his mother and St. Joseph and all of the greatest of saints are not exempt from having to entrust their lives to God and his providence and to accept the mystery, to accept the darkness, to accept sometimes that which makes very little sense to us. And so there's, a, there's an element of humility there, right? When we think about the mother of God and uh, the many of the instructions that were given to the Holy Family were given to St. Joseph, not to, to the Mother of God. Now, we know clearly that in terms of ranking, in terms of hierarchy of, of, of uh, sanctity or holiness, we know that the Mother of God is above all of the saints. She's above the, the archangels and the angels and all the martyrs and all the saints and above St. Joseph. And yet, she didn't demand that the clarity of what was demanded by or requested by God in terms of, say, fleeing to Egypt or or coming when they were to come back, that it come to her, but it came to Saint Joseph, and she accepted that. So there's there's a relationship between humility and trust, because if I'm humble, if I accept to be last and to be least, right, then I'm able to let go of control. I'm able to let go of that need for, for, for understanding and clarity. Um, so St. Mary is a beautiful example here where she, she allows even the, the will of God be communicated to, to St. Joseph and he leads the Holy Family and he guides the Holy Family to fulfill the will of God. Now, many times we can see this lack of humility within ourselves when we ask the question, why me? Right? When something happens to me, many of us will say, why me? And the humble person will not say, why me, but will say, why not me? Right? And that's why now is a good time, as we're going through all this, to meditate, to reflect on you know, how all of us are participants in what's happening. You know, just as the mother of God and St. Joseph and all of the, uh, the saints never escaped suffering and never escaped um, difficulties in their lives, we all have to participate. Some of us will get the virus. Some of us may even die from the virus. Some of us, um, you know, uh, we encounter all kinds of catastrophes. We lose loved ones. We get into accidents. None of us are exempt from participating in this mystery, this darkness. And the humble person accepts, you know, and prepares himself or herself every day to accept whatever God in his providence allows. Or as in the example of um, what I heard uh, said by, I don't know if it was one of the modern saints or, or one of the ancient saints, that, 
kind of this idea of, of writing a blank check to God every morning. Have you said yes to God in advance for whatever he will allow to happen to you and to me? And, and this is something that we should think about. Or do we wait for something to happen and then say, why me? There's a, a beautiful story I read about a, a young girl. Her name is Kiara. She was born 1971, died in 1990. And um, she had a very aggressive form of, uh, and a very painful form of bone cancer at the age of 17. And as I mentioned from the dates of her birth and death, that she obviously didn't live very long, uh, maybe 19 years old when she passed away. And when she was in the midst of all of this pain and all of this suffering, whenever anybody spoke to her, she, would, she had a, a saying that she often repeated. She said, for you, Jesus, if you want it, I want it too. For you, Jesus, if you want it, I want it too. If you will it, I will it too. If you allow it, I allow it too. If you see it as good for me, I also see it as good for me. Right? And this is, this is the, the beautiful example that we get in the lives of the saints. Um, so uh, in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 21, verse 19, um, our Lord says, By your patient endurance, you will gain your souls. Sometimes it's translated as by your patience, you will possess your souls. There are different variations of the same verse in terms of, um, uh, you know, New King James or RSV. But I like, I like this translation, by your patient endurance. It's not just patience, but it's endurance that is um, combined with this idea of patience. And so, so much of our spiritual life depends on this moment by moment endurance. Every moment of our life is an opportunity for us to patiently endure, to wait, to have trust, to have courage. Right? And so, again, courage, we think about courage. Courage, a courageous person is not somebody who is exempt from fear, but a courageous person is somebody who acts in the face of fear. Right? A courageous person is not somebody who has been exempted from the experience of, of, uh, of being afraid for their life but is somebody who, who acts and chooses courage in the face of fear. And this is, again, how faith must work in our life, that we have to choose trust. We have to choose surrender and abandonment in the face of mystery, in the face of darkness, in the face of fear. And our Lord gives us a couple examples of this um, where he talks about the treasure buried in the field. He says, a man sells all that he owns in order to buy that precious treasure that he finds buried in the field. Or another example he gives is that about the pearl of great price, right? He says, a merchant sells everything that he has in order to buy that precious pearl, right? And what he's saying by these, in these examples is you can, um, we can look at our, during this time that we're in, we can look at our lives and say, what do I value the most? And if you answer that question, then you will have the answer to the other question, which is, what do I fear losing the most? Right. What do I value the most will tell you, what do, I, what do I fear losing the most? And so that's why Christ says, but if you find that treasure or that pearl of great price and you value it more than everything else that you owned, then you are willing to sell, let go of everything else, in order to acquire that treasure or that pearl of great price. So I think for me and for you, this is a perfect time for us to ask ourselves, what do I value the most? Do I value my health, my family, my church service, um, you know, my, my work? And that'll tell you what you fear losing the most. But if you anchor your soul again, and something much more valuable, much more eternal and lasting, and much more the cause of your happiness, your eternal happiness, then we, we can begin to let go of some of the fear that we have of losing these other things. Again, one spiritual father says, fear has a way of blinding us. Fear rivets our attention on that thing we fear to the exclusion of everything else around us. 
That one thing is all we can think about, all we can see. Fear narrows our worldview and our vision becomes myopic, nearsighted to the point of exclusion. Right? So fear causes us to have this tunnel vision where I can only see that which I fear or I fear losing, and I'm unable to see everything else that's happening around me. Father Henry Nouwen, he speaks about um, this beautiful concept of open-ended waiting, open-ended waiting. The Christian is, uh, and I'll try to wrap up in a couple minutes here so I can get to some of your questions, but uh, the Christian life is a, is a life of waiting, right? You can find it very beautifully expressed in the Psalms of David, this constant stance of waiting upon the Lord, hoping in the Lord, waiting for the Lord to act, for his power to manifest itself for his mercy to be um, poured out. Now, what Father Henry Nouwen is speaking about is, is a very different kind of waiting than earthly waiting or um, the waiting that we think of when we're waiting for the bus or we're waiting for our, our, our coffee uh, to, you know, for the, um, at the Starbucks line, you know, um, or we're waiting for this pandemic to end or we're waiting for um, a breakthrough in uh, the treatment for this pandemic, right? When we're waiting for those kinds of things, there we have in our mind specifically what we're waiting for, and nothing else can be a substitute. We know what we're waiting for. We're waiting for the bus to come. If the bus doesn't come, it's a disaster, right? But what Father Henry Nowen is talking about, he says the Christian is in an open-ended state of waiting, right? That he's only waiting for God to do what God is going to do. He is only waiting for God to, to, to be God, right? And to send us his grace, his mercy, his power, his love in whatever way, in whatever form he chooses to send it to us. And in, at whatever time he chooses to send it to us. And he is happy and content knowing that at every moment, God is doing what God should be doing. And God is doing what God does from his love and from his, again, his goodness. So, Again, this, this idea of open-ended waiting is something that we can practice during this time. And then, again, as I maybe alluded to a little bit earlier, this idea of finding answers versus living our life. Right? There's a beautiful, again, example in the Gospels where the disciples asked the Lord, Lord, will only a few be saved? Will only a few be saved? And he didn't answer them the, the inquiry that they had. They wanted... They wanted statistics, they wanted uh, percentages, they wanted numbers, right? Um, but he said to them in response, he said, strive to enter through the narrow door. He didn't even answer you know, their inquiry. Lord, will only a few be saved? Strive to enter through the narrow door. In other words, um, live your life, and in living your life in accordance with the will in, in, of God, the answers will come. You know. Um, Father uh, Wilfred Stinnison, he, he says, in regards to this, he says, life is too short to give us answers to all our questions. You have been given your time to live life. In Christianity, life comes before any speculation about it. And this life is extremely simple. Love God and your neighbor. That is what it all comes down to. Experience shows that the one who lives this way in love will eventually receive answers to his or her questions. The answers grow out of life itself. The answers grow out of life itself. So we began with the disciples in the upper room, but we can also end with the disciples in that anxious period that they lived between the Ascension and the Pentecost. Remember, 40 days after the resurrection of our Lord, um, they were told to wait for power from on high to come to them. So we can imagine what those 10 days were like, 10 days without the post-resurrection uh, appearances of our Lord, 10 days without the Holy Spirit coming, right? a time of waiting, a time of entrustment, a time of mystery, perhaps even a time of anxiety, perhaps even a time of fear of not knowing what was going to happen after that. right? And so another image I will leave you with is the difference between floating and swimming. Floating, sometimes when we're, if we're imagined being thrown in the middle of the ocean, we have to make our way to 
shore. If we try to swim and, and out of fear and anxiety, we start kicking and screaming, we know that it's only a short amount of time and we're going to drown. So sometimes our only hope is to float and let the current take us to shore. And floating here, um, the analogy, of course, is that the sea here is, is God. Swimming represents our resistance. And floating represents us submitting and following the will of God and his providence and trusting and abandoning ourselves to him. But floating is not a passive work. Floating is not something that we just sit by idly. But in order for us to keep our head above water and to float requires a great amount of attention, a great amount of, of, um, of, of willpower as well. So I'll end with the final uh, couple of quotes. Father uh, Dodger, again, he says that the fruit of the spiritual life, the fruit of um, faith is peace. He says, true peace is the fruit of spiritual life, the fruit of faith deepened as a result of trials. We receive this peace not at the start, but at the finish. True peace is not so much the evidence of achievement, but the result of a choice. The peace of Christ comes as a result of your choosing him. So the more we entrust, the more we have faith, the more the fruit of all of that will be a deepening peace within us. And then my last quote is from uh, an archbishop uh, by the name of Luis Martinez, who uh, I, I just love this quote about faith. He says, faith penetrates all recesses and finds God behind all concealments. Our Lord can hide himself from all things except faith. Faith penetrates all recesses and finds God behind all concealments. Our Lord can hide himself from all things except faith. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Um, I want to uh, request that if you had um, any questions or if you have questions that you, if you could post them uh, kind of now towards the end of the uh, chat feed because uh, I don't know if I'll be able to go back all the way to the top and see some of the questions that were asked. Somebody's asking, um, what will happen if churches don't open before Easter? How are we going to have an Easter ceremony? Honestly, I don't have an answer for that question. I think, uh, at least in our diocese, in the Diocese of Los Angeles in Southern California, we're meeting with um, our bishop, our metropolitan and our bishops on a weekly basis through online meetings. And we're kind of assessing things, um, you know, week by week. So we've kind of postponed that discussion about Holy Week and Easter for, for um, this upcoming week and the week after. So I don't know what will happen in, in Egypt and in other parts of the world. So I think uh, as far as my ability to answer that question, I would only say that we have to wait a little bit more and see what happens in the next week or so. Is there a conflict between waiting and laziness? It's a very good question. Well, as I tried to kind of point out at the end there with regards to the analogy of floating versus swimming, waiting is not a passive activity. Uh, waiting is not uh, simply um, closing our, our eyes and our ears uh, to, to everything that's happening to us and just kind of hiding, you know, hunkered down in a corner somewhere. But waiting again is receptivity. Waiting is attention. Waiting is diligent seeking, right? Because what we're waiting for is um, we're waiting for, for God to reveal himself to us. Not so much in a way that answers our speculation or gives us clarity on things, but in a way that where he reveals his love, he reveals his mercy, he reveals his grace. He reveals to us, again, the invitation to keep waiting and trusting. Um, and so it's not a passive thing, but, you know, in the, in the Orthodox tradition of spirituality, we often talk about things like attentiveness, guard, guarding the heart, um, watchfulness, right? All of these expressions are, are alluding to the same idea, right? It's imagine if you were like a security guard, 
right? You know, you're, you're standing in wait. That's not a passive thing. You are, you're, but you, because you, you, are in, you are in a position of attention, your eyes are open, you are seeking and looking, right? The same idea of like in the, uh, in the Desert Fathers and uh, many of the um, spiritual fathers <clears throat> speak about the spiritual life as a, or the, the heart of the Christian as a garden. And um, we have to do all of the things to tend the garden, right? We have to plant the seeds, we have to water the, the soil, we have to have good soil, we have to have sunlight and so on. But we also have to guard, we have to watch, we have to put a hedge around the garden and we have to watch against enemies, right? And so waiting has a, an aspect in, in relation to God, but it also has an aspect in guarding, right? Protecting ourselves from the fears and the anxieties and the temptations and the whisperings of the evil one, right? And, and those kinds of things. So I would, I would say, I would maybe leave it at that for now. So uh, can maybe look at some other questions. Somebody is saying the um, the Virgin Mary's inner thoughts and feelings towards pain and dealing with pain during the flight were not revealed. Yes, of course, um, there is very little that that is actually spoken about the Mother of God in the Scriptures, but we know that at the very beginning, um, in the encounter of Saint Mary with Simeon the Elder, that her life would be characterized by a life of sorrow, a life of pain, a life of suffering, and that um, there are times in the Scriptures where we, we, we do see that St. That Mary, Saint Mary, it says she kept and pondered these things in her heart, right? So uh, the mother of God lived a very hidden life, an inwardly hidden life, and also an externally hidden life. But we know that she was a, a, a woman of sorrows. She shared in the sorrows of her son. As we say in the prayers of the Igbeya, she stood at the foot of the cross, and her, uh, her pain was tremendous, of course. And so we know we, we we can certainly conclude that the experience of saint mary in terms of the flight to egypt in terms of giving birth to the child in a manger right in terms of the poverty that they lived that it was a life of suffering and sorrow that she endured that she accepted as, as you know her her yes to god from the beginning remained with her right let it be done to me according to your word that was the interior disposition of the mother of god in every aspect of her life from the moment she consented to be the mother of God, that was that was her const, constant fiat, you know, as they say in the Latin tradition. Uh, Let it be done to me according to your word. Somebody's saying, uh, we miss you, we love you, God bless you, miss you, love you too, thank you. Somebody's asking about some book suggestions, and I, I think maybe be better for me to Type up some uh, some some book titles and their authors rather than try to just remember them on air, and I can maybe send that to the um, group at Coptic Orthodox Answers and or maybe I can add it to the comments below after the uh, YouTube video is recorded. Sorry, I'm not very good at this, so I have to look at some of these recent questions and read them. How do we discern when it is appropriate to swim instead of float, especially in situations where it would result in security and would seem irrational not to seek such security? Well, uh, look, again, um, behind a question like this, is a question about clarity, right? It's a question of like, how do I know how to deal with this tension, this spiritual tension within my life? How do I know when to act, when to, you know, when not to act, when to float, when to swim, right? And I, I'm, not, I'm not dodging the question, but I'm saying that the very question in and of itself is indicative of, of a lot of what we're, we've been talking about, right? It's this, it's this pain that we all feel of not always having clarity. Now, that's why, you know, we love, for example, in our Orthodox tradition, when we hear about 
some saint who has the gift of clairvoyance or somebody who can read your heart or somebody who has the gift of prophecy, right? Because we could go to that person and they can tell us with clarity something that's happening within us or something that we need to do act upon in our life. But this isn't, of course, the, 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 the typical means that we have at our disposal in the spiritual life. We have ultimately to do what we can by prayer, um, by seeking good godly counsel through our spiritual fathers and our confession fathers and other godly people that we have in our life, fr good friends and uh, you know, parents and grandparents, right? People who have experience in life. We seek good counsel. We pray. Uh, we have perhaps a good spiritual father or elder that we can turn to. And we do the best that we can. And again, we trust. We trust that if we're not doing the what is asked of us, that God will not lead us astray, that he will, you know, he, that he will ultimately send us the help that we need. He will ultimately guide us along. And, and sometimes all I can do and all you can do is throw your arms up towards heaven and say, Lord, be merciful. Lord, be kind. Lord, send us your grace. You know, or to say, like with David in Psalm 118, Lord, I am thine, save me. I am yours, O Lord, save me, right? And to beg him for, for, for that guidance and for that spiritual direction. Um, with regards to clarity versus trust, does the concept change when we're talking about short-term decisions? Well, yes, because sometimes we have to make a decision, right? And we can't always wait for, for clarity. And so, you know, uh, you know, you, we face those kinds of decisions on a daily basis. You know, today I have to make a decision about something and I might have two choices or three choices. Again, I do the best that I can by um, spending a moment in prayer, by perhaps seeking godly counsel from somebody. And then even then, if I have no clarity, then I have to make a decision. And at that point, I make the decision the best I can trusting again in the goodness of God that if this decision in the long run is not a good decision or is harmful for me, for me towards me or for me, that he has a way out, right? There is, a, there is, it's not the end of the story, right? But we can't be paralyzed in our lives. We can't, we can't stop living and acting and moving. We all, you know, that's somebody who always had certainty, you know, clarity, because when you, when you study her life, you see that she made decisions very quickly and, um, and when she made decisions, she, she made them, they were very adamant, you know, she was very adamant about her choices, her decisions. So she seemed like somebody who was acting with a tremendous amount of clarity, as if like she knew God's will at every moment. So when somebody like that tells you that she never had clarity, or that she rarely had clarity, but that she always had trust, it means that she understood in the goodness of God who entrusted her with a mission or a vocation and told her, go out. And live your life. Go out and do what I asked you to do, to feed and to take care of the poorest of the poor. And so she did that, trusting that every little decision that she made, knowing that some of them weren't going to be the right decisions, but she trusted God in doing making those decisions. Because if we sit there and wait for clarity, we will we will just become passive and uh, and lazy in our spiritual life. So. How can parents explain this situation to kids like it is God's will? And if yes, they'll ask why God allow this or this something from evil. Well, it depends, of course, on the age of the children, to the extent to, that we can um, speak about these concepts with uh, varying kind of um, nuance and, and, and difficulty. But we can give them the simple example as how the greatest evil that happened in the history of mankind was the crucifixion of the Son of God. And from that greatest evil, God brought about the greatest good for humankind. Right? That's a very simple concept that is powerful for us as adults, but also very powerful for children, that, that God allowed the most evil incident in all of human history to unleash itself on his own son. And in doing that, he was able to bring about the greatest good. 
So we can tell our children that even though because evil exists and suffering exists, and maybe we can give them a little bit of understanding of the reason behind that with regards to the fall and so on, that God in his goodness and his love will always bring about something good from it, you know. And this is, we can speak to them a little bit about God's justice, you know, that those who are deprived in this life will receive more in the next life. Those who suffer more in this life will be glorified more in the next life, right? So God is fair. He is just. And so he will never, we, we will never outdo God in terms of fairness or love or justice or goodness. So I think in this way, we can speak uh, to our children. I'm going to scroll up a little bit to see if there's some uh, questions related to the topic that I missed. Hi, Abuna. If one lives in a really tough home environment with things escalating during this time period of staying home, how do we practice that interior asceticism that you were mentioning? Actually, it's a very good question. And I would say that this is the perfect opportunity for us to practice that kind of interior asceticism because we are all um, spending so much time uh, hunkered down in our homes and not going out, uh, right? Obviously, all of us are, are, are uh, um, not exposed to a lot of external uh, stimulus and a lot of external en uh, encounters and, uh, you know, activities. And so uh, being at home, you know, we have the opportunity, first of all, to spend more time in reflection, uh, to spend a little bit more time with ourselves, evaluating our lives and uh, examining our consciences, but also practicing in the little things that are happening in our homes, this interior asceticism, for example, patience, right? I'm sure, uh, you know, when you spend a lot of time in an enclosed area with, you know, close family members, it's bound to happen that you're going to become impatient with one another, right? So th this then is the perfect opportunity for us to practice patience, right? I mean, if we could practice patience in this circumstance, then it will help us when the circumstances change to continue practicing patience in, in other circumstances, right? This is an opportunity to practice forgiveness, knowing that you're going to see the same people every morning and every night, you know, 24 hours a day for the next several weeks, right? Should compel you to not allow things to continue to the next day. So if there's a conflict, if there's a problem, force yourself to seek forgiveness and reconciliation today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Right. So I always say that that in the home, the home is the hardest place to be spiritual. Right. Many of us are good at wearing masks. Many of us are good at, um, let's say, if, I, if somebody has an anger problem, you know, usually they're pretty good at controlling their anger problem at church, in front of other people, at their workplace. But when they come home, they unleash their anger, let's say. So and, in, and the same applies to many faults that we have. Right. But that maybe is just an easy one to think of, right? Because outside, our ego kicks in and we protect ourselves and our images. And so we're able to have more self-control. Our willpower, again, kicks in to, to kind of shield us from. But at home, we kind of let that shield down and, and we, we manifest some of those weaknesses. So, so sometimes the home is the hardest place to be spiritual. But then it, that means it's the best place to practice your spirituality. The home is the best, the best battleground for practicing the virtues, right? To practicing patience and quietness and, and forgiveness and reconciliation and love and sacrifice, right? So I would say that, yes, although that during this time, it's a difficult time for, for, for many, being stuck at home and, uh, and the boredom and the getting on each other's nerves and all of that, but it also means it's the perfect time to practice that interior mortification or that interior asceticism. Go back to the bottom here and see if... Uh...
<clears throat> How can we balance online classes from college chores and Bible study? Well, I think, you know, um, again, this is something that's going to differ from person to person, but, you know, I think one thing that we can try to practice maybe an emulation of the monastic life, right? I mean, one of the beautiful things that, that come out of the monastic life is a certain life of discipline. Um, you know, the, the, in, in the monastic communities, the communal monastic communities, right? There's a certain discipline. They, you know, the, the community wakes up at the same time. They pray at the same time. They eat at the same time. Uh, they do their work at the same time. And that repetitive nature of monastic life allows them to, again, be able to focus inwardly and interiorly on their spiritual life and the relationship with God. So I think one of the things that we can try to do during this time is to, to establish some sort of um, discipline, right? Discipline with our time and praying and uh, spending time in fellowship uh, with our family and so on. So we can actually look to the monastic life during this time and um, and, and see in that a, a wonderful opportunity for us uh, to establish a little bit more spiritual discipline in our own lives. So I think we've gone a little bit over an hour and I think um, rather than uh, some, of, some of the questions are really, really off topic, which I, I, I'm not... Uh, you know, of course, faulting anybody for asking them, I just feel like it'll take us in many different directions. And I would rather that maybe we end up on this note. And um, I thank you all for uh, for being with me during this time. And, and I, I pray that uh, our reflection together was of some uh, benefit to you. And uh, again, I appreciate um, you giving me the time to be with you this morning, this afternoon, for those in the uh, East Coast. And ask you to pray for me as we all pray for the world. And glory be to God forever. Amen.